Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I'm just going to pray before we get into the word this morning. So, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, it goes out, it never returns empty or void, but it fulfills that that you purposed it to fulfill. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that you would lead us into all truth by your spirit this morning, and that, Father, you would quicken us in our understanding of your word. That, Father, you would write your laws upon our heart, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. So today, if you want a sermon title, a sermon title, it's the Balm of Gilead. The Balm of Gilead. And if you don't know what that is, we're going to look at that this morning and we're going to unpack it. We're going to see exactly what we can learn about the Balm of Gilead and why it was important and also is it relevant today? If it is relevant, how is it relevant? Amen? So the definition of balm, a balm, is a general name for an oily or clear substance which flows or trickles from particular trees or plants. So if you, if you cut a, a daffodil in the stalk, you'll see that white sap, and that's uh, the same as a balm. They were used in the ancient world for many different things. They flavoured mummified meats. They perfumed and preserved the bodies of those who had died. And they were also used for healing. Scholars were unable to determine how uh, the farm of Gilead was made, exactly what was in it, but it seems to be a smoothing uh, aromatic resin from a tree or a plant. It might be modernly today compared to aloe vera. Aloe vera, a very similar substance to the uh, balm of Gilead, aloe vera. It's also important to note that myrrh, one of the three gifts given to Jesus by the wise men when he was born as a child, as a baby, uh, Myrrh was presented and it is very, very, very similar to the balm of Gilead. Okay? And it, it comes from a very similar type of plant. Now, Gilead, so that's balm. Gilead was a mountain region. So, Gilead was a mountain region east of the River Jordan and it was situated in what is now modern day Jordan. Okay? It's also referred, it's reference to, carries the same meaning in Hebrew, which is Gilead, which means a heap of stones. So Gilead means heap of stones or of testimony, either a heap of stones or testimony. So we're going to turn to some scriptures just to see how we get that information, how we arrive at that point. So Genesis 31. Genesis 31 and verse 43. Laban answered Jacob, The women are my daughters, the children are my children, the flocks are my flocks. All that you see is mine. Yet what can I do today about these daughters of mine or the children they have born? Come, let us make a covenant, you and I. Let it serve as a witness between us. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. He said to his relatives, gather stones. So they gathered stones and piled them in a heap. And they ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jadasephira. Jacob was called, called it Gilead. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today, and that's why it's called Gilead. So the first mention of it is this particular place was a place of covenant. Okay? So a covenant took place between Laban and Jacob. Laban was to become his father-in-law. So a covenant took place between the two of them, and in this covenant they worshipped God and they ate a meal as well. So it was a significant place, and that's how it originally got its name. 
It's also interesting when you when you research it that you find that Gilead is also the place where Gideon defeated the uh, uh, the Midianites, and it was also the home of the prophet Elijah. So this place is a place of covenant. It was a place where uh, they ate and had fellowship. It was the place where Gideon defeated the Midianites and it was also the home of the great prophet Elijah. We also read in 2 Samuel that David, when David was on the run from his son Absalom, when Absalom rebelled against his father, David ran and stayed at Gilead. So there was something significant about Gilead that even David would go there. And it's interesting what David does. When, when uh, Absalom rebels against David, notice that David doesn't stay in Jerusalem and put his foot down and says, this is the city of David, this belongs to me. David thinks of the people first and he wants to remove the danger away from Jerusalem, so he leaves Jerusalem completely. And that is to take away the danger that could have been there. And in our lives, sometimes you've got to stop being so stubborn and say, well, this is my right and I'm going to stand here and I don't care who it affects. This is mine. And sometimes you've got to say, do you know what? For the sake of peace and the greater good, I'm just going to back off. I'm not going to stand on my rights. I'm just going to let this go. Okay? You can practice that in the week when you're parking at Tesco's and everyone's fighting for a parking bay. You can say, J I got it, but, but do you know what? You can have it, it's fine. I'll park in that one. You know? But whatever in life, sometimes we stand on our rights. There are some rights and traditions that we stand on and we don't even know what they mean. We've just inherited them over the years. And we don't actually know why we do it anymore. Uh, one, one in our family is Christmas pudding. So when I was a boy growing up, we always had Christmas pudding. And every year, my dad would get the brandy, took plenty of it, it drowned the Christmas pudding, it was baptised in brandy, the Christmas pudding. Then he would set light to it and watch it burn, and then he would eat it. Well, years later, me and Mama got married, and each year I would get buy a Christmas pudding and a small bottle of brandy and do the same. The only trouble was I didn't like Christmas pudding. So I used to buy it, light it, watch it go out and then throw it in the bin. And mum would say, what's wrong with you? I'd say, well, my dad always did it, so I kind of feel that I should do it. She said, yeah, but you don't like it and you're wasting money. Get a dessert you like. I said, well, yeah, but we're going to do this on Christmas if you don't do this. And sometimes we can get into doing things, standing on our rights or just doing it, just because, well, kind of that's what we do. But it's not necessarily the right thing to do anymore. And sometimes we do things that we do them out of habit because God told us that that was for a season and we need to move on. Okay? But we're still stuck a little bit in the spiritual old, and we're still doing that practice, although it was great for that time, it was wonderful for that season, you heard from God, but now it's a new season, it's a new time, and so now you've got to move, and you can almost feel you're being unfaithful, because, well, haven't we always done it this way? Well, yes, and it was wonderful, celebrate what has happened, but now you need to move on to what is now. And the only way you'll ever do that is being sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because the Spirit leads us. So we see the basis of the balm and the basis of the man of Gilead. The balm of Gilead is mentioned three times in the Word. The first of these is in Genesis 37 when Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers, as recorded in uh, Genesis 37, Genesis 37 and verse 25. 
And it says, as they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming to Gilead. Now, Ishmaelites came from Ishmael, okay? He had Isaac and Ishmael, and Ishmael was the firstborn of Abraham, but he wasn't the child of promise, okay? But nonetheless, there was a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balms, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what shall we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. The brothers agreed. And so then the Midianite merchants came by. His brothers called Joseph out of the system and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Okay? So in Jeremiah 8, we read the vision of the prophet that it received as well. We're going to get to that. But this bit significant because you've got the Ishmaelites and the Midianites. Now Gideon conquered the Midianites, but they were all coming from Gilead. And their, their camels or horses were loaded with myrrhs and spices because that, in the Middle East, that was the area that produced this balm. And so people would buy it and the Ishmaelites and Midianites basically sold it right across the Middle East. And that's how they would get their income. Notice as well that Joseph's brothers, although you can think, oh, at least Joseph got out of the situation, he shouldn't have been in it, okay? You cannot choose the lesser of the two evils. It was still sin. They still abused him. They still lied to their father. They still sent him away as a slave, amen? And sometimes you think, well, I'll choose the lesser of the two evils. This one isn't quite as bad. Well, it is. You know, in God's eyes, sin is sin, okay? In Jeremiah 8, we read the vision of the prophet Jeremiah and the seed from the Lord, and it's about the exile of Judah to Babylon. The nation of Israel had abandoned their covenant with the Lord, and they had consulted with other nations, and they worshipped other gods and other idols, and this provoked God's anger, meaning that his hand would be over uh, the Babylonians. This greatly distressed Jeremiah, whose heart within him grew faint, and he began to intercede and lament. Now, remember, God is a jealous God. God is a jealous God. God is not a God of rules and uh, parameters and boundaries. God is a God of love. And often our view of the Father or of God is a dictatorial ruler who has this rule book and we all must do what he says because he likes having his own way. Okay? That is not God. God is a father who loves us and he puts his parameters around us because he loves us. Because he so loves us. It's not rules and regulations. It's a love of grace. And I love to I still do. I love my children. I loved them when they were young. And so I put rules and parameters around them for their protection. Not because I wanted to be a killjoy. So when they were seven and eight years old, bedtime was eight o'clock. And they didn't like it. They would moan and cry and want to stay up. But I knew if they didn't go to bed at eight o'clock, they wouldn't fall asleep till nine o'clock, and then they'd wake up in the morning and they'd be tired. And they wouldn't be able to focus on their schoolwork. So what I was actually doing was that of a loving father. But to my children, dad's being a meanie, he's making us go to bed at eight o'clock. But if you're wise and you've got young children, if you, if you just bring the hours in a bit, what me and Mara used to do is say, well, we want the children to go to bed at eight, uh, say, uh, 8 o'clock, so what we would do, we would tell them your normal bedtime is 7 o'clock. That's your normal bedtime. 
Well, a couple of times a week, to, to bless you, we'll let you go to bed at 8 o'clock. Now, for us, that was the normal bedtime anyway. Okay? So you've got to be smart with kids. So suddenly, we're not the villains anymore. We're the heroes. Right, mum and dad let us stay up late. We haven't got to go to bed till 8 o'clock. When in actual fact, we were happy with that anyway. So God isn't a dictatorial God who's, who's trying to... The boundaries that he places on us are because he loves us. He lo and he's jealous. I want God to be jealous. If he's not jealous, then what do I mean to him? I want God to be jealous. I want uh, my wife to be jealous if I'm talking to somebody and they're getting all fussy. I want, why? Because I love her and I want to be wanted. You know, jealousy in the right format is actually a good thing in the right format, in the right understanding. And God is a jealous God. He doesn't want to share you with his tenderness. <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't want to even share you with Combination Street. He doesn't want to share you with the gym. He doesn't want to share you with your hobbies. He doesn't want to share you with uh, your worries. He doesn't want to share you with your concerns. He wants you all for himself because he's a jealous God and he loves you and he loves every part of you and he accepts you and he wants you all for him. Wow, what a lovely God we have. So Jeremiah uh, 8 verse 21 says, Since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn and horror grips me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there or doctor? Why then is there no healing for the wounds of my people? So Gilead was a place of healing because of the bomb. Gilead was a place where they had doctors and medical support. So in the Middle East, people would even travel to Gilead to get help for their various ailments of their body, various diseases and problems that they had. Jeremiah uh, 46 and verse 11. Jeremiah 46, 46 and verse 11. We see here the balm of Gilead mentioned again. In this chapter, uh, Jeremiah prophesies the Lord's judgment upon Egypt because of their haughtiness, their pride and arrogance Despite all their chariots, all their weaponry, the Egyptians would be defeated by the Babylonian army and they would have to retreat back and they would be led to Gilead. Okay, so uh, Jeremiah 46 verse 11. Go up to Gilead and get balm, virgin daughter Egypt. But you may try many medicines in vain. There is no healing for you. The whole nation will hear of your shame. Your cries will fill the earth. One warrior will stumble over another and both will fall down together. So Egypt is coming under the punishment of God and they're desperate to get healing. And so what, what do they want to do? They want to go to Gilead. They want to get the balm. They want to get the healing. But... There will be no healing for you. You try many medicines in vain. Okay? So we can see that the balm of Gilead had significance in the Old Testament. And it was well known across all the ancient world and civilization for its healing and medical purposes. We could also see, especially in Jeremiah, that it was a metaphor for hope and healing. That uh, even today, some people say, oh, the, the, the uh, balm of Gilead as a metaphor, not as a reality. It was especially important to the Israelites, as the location was a place of testimony, it was a place of victory. And whenever the, the uh, Israelites got uh, insecure in their relationship with God. They always wanted to move to a place of security, you know. And every people are very different in life. Some people, when they struggle, 
they go inward on themselves and they step away from God. Their prayer life decreases, their worship, their church attendance, their fellowship. Why? Because they're struggling with something. And it begins to, to form a barrier, a problem, and they step further and further away from God. Some would even blame God. Well, why didn't you do this? Why haven't you done that? Why did you let this happen? All sorts of questions can come in. Other people, <coughs> and I'm part of the second group, <coughs> Other people go the other way. And when trouble's on the horizon, they get closer to God. And they spend more time reading their Bible, and more time in worship, and more time chasing God, and more time in fellowship. And that's very much me. I'm a chicken. You know, when Goliath's coming, I'm getting close to Dad. I want to be close to the Lord. If there's trouble in the camp, I know where I want to be. Okay? And I need the brotherhood. You know? But sometimes the enemy tries to pick off the sheep. Isolation makes you feel not good enough because you've got a problem or because something's gone wrong or an area of sin that you're struggling to get past and shame and guilt come in and you begin to remove yourself because you feel ashamed. See, and that's the ploy of the enemy to get you on your own. If one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. And there's strength in togetherness. That's why the church is so important. When we come together, when we worship, we encourage one another, we build each other up, we make each other strong. You know? And the enemy finds it more difficult to get in. Why? Because we're in unity. It's easy to pick off one sheep. Years and years ago, I drove up to Northamptonshire me and my friend, and we were going to a conference. And uh, I was about 19, we didn't have no money to stay anywhere, so we thought, well, we'll drive up, and we'll just park in the field and sleep in the car. And so that seemed sensible to us, so we drove up, found a field, parked in it, and then in the night we couldn't sleep, we're two 19-year-olds, full of energy, so we get out and we see that there's all these sheep in the field, I mean, hundreds of them. And so we, we decided to chase the sheep, this is about three o'clock in the morning, in a field in Northampton, uh, Northamptonshire. So we're running across this field and we're chasing the sheep like lunatic farmers and we're chasing all the sheep and then we get them all into a corner. But all of a sudden these sheep must have been on steroids. They went mad and they just ran at us, absolutely chased us. We were bricking, we were running and off to jump over fences, diving through bushes, trying to get away from these sheep. See, the problem is, as we were chasing them, they were splitting off and they were insecure. But once they had nowhere else to go, they were all together. And suddenly they remembered how strong they were. And me and my friend, we just ran and ran and ran. We went to the conference the next day and we stunk. <laughs> because what's in sheep? The sheep fields, well, they need their little packages, and at three o'clock in the morning, you can't see their packages. But nonetheless. So we, we've got to make sure we do things the God way. <coughs> now, although the barn was powerful, it was important, it brought healing, there was a major issue with the barn. There was a major issue with the barn. There was one thing the barn could not do, and it was the most important thing that needed to happen. And the barn of Gilead could not heal the hearts of the people. It got rid of all the external ailments and problems, but it still left the Israelites rebellious. They were still in rebellion. They still wanted their own way. It provided medicine for the body, body healing for physical sickness, but it was futile against spiritual sickness. And some of the problem we have today is we are still hankering after the balm of Gilead when we've got a new balm that we should be using. The balm of Gilead is outdated. The balm of Gilead is a part of the old 
Testament law, the balm of Gideon was part of the old covenant. But we've got a new balm, and it's the balm of Golgotha, the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus was more powerful than the balm of Gilead because the blood of Jesus could penetrate and change the heart of men. Hallelujah. Now the problem we have is we're still applying the principles of the balm of Gilead instead of applying the blood of Jesus. And we're using the wrong thing and we're complaining we're not getting the right result. But we're using the wrong thing. And we've got to step up into recognising the powerful new covenant that the church is in through the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because there is nothing more powerful than the blood of Jesus. Amen. The alarming symptom of the spiritual sickness called rebellion against God, which God justly punished. The people refused to repent and acknowledge their rebellion. Time and time again we do it. We fall over the same rock time and time and time again. How many times have you gone to God and said, God, I am fed up with me. How can you not be fed up with me? How many times do I have to drop the ball? How many times do I have to get it wrong? How many times do I have to embarrass you? How many times I feel like I don't, surely I don't love you if I can't conquer this. How can I claim to love you and then I do do what I don't want to do? And I'm frustrated, Lord. And it makes you feel unworthy. And you, you come in for healing, you're coming for healing, but the healing is a mental process which you're using the balm of Gilead for instead of the blood of Jesus. And we've got to start, see, there's one problem. With the Israelites, they were told to apply the blood. When the spirit of death came with Pharaoh, and it was going to wipe out the firstborn, the Israelites were told, get a heifer, dip it in blood, put it over your doorpost and down your doorframe. Okay? And then the spirit of death will not touch your household. Guess what? Those who didn't do it, death came. See, you can't leave the blood of Jesus in a bowl beside the bed. It's not going to do anything. You've got to start applying the blood of Jesus. Every time Nehemiah will move house, we're there. We're praying over the door frames. We're praying over the windows. We're praying over the back door. We don't know what's happened in the house. Somebody could have been raped. Somebody could have died. But somebody could have been murdered. Maybe the marriage was an adulterous one. Maybe the husband was violent. Maybe children were abused. We don't know the history. We'd better get that blood of Jesus out and just soak the place. And you do that through prayer. Every single car we've ever bought, we've pleaded the blood of Jesus over it. We've said, Lord, we thank you that this car might be used to glorify you. May it be a blessing to the kingdom of God. And we plead the blood of Jesus, your protection over this car, in Jesus' name. And we are applying the blood. Amen? Instead of having the oil and balm of Gilead that you keep in a bowl, you need to start applying the blood of Jesus, start taking some authority Amen. in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Isaiah 53, verse 3, talking about Jesus, a prophetic uh, statement. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering, familiar with pain, isn't that isn't it, uh, reassuring to know that the pain that we go through, Jesus is familiar with? Amen. And you can say, yeah, but he never experienced this, that, 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 this, that. He experienced all things known to men in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, the agony was so great that he sweat turned to drops of blood because he anguished. The, 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 the pressure was so great in the Garden of Gethsemane three times he said, Father, if there's another way we can get the same outcome, then let's take it, but not why will your, yours be done. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus asked the Father for a get-out clause. He didn't ask the Father for a get-out clause on the cross. 
That was the physical pain. But it was the spiritual, mental pain in the Garden of Gethsemane which would purchase our freedom. That was the pain he went through. And he experienced everything we experience. Wow. So you're not on your own, even in your pain. He's with you in it. Amen? Wonderful. Surely, he took up our pain. He bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We are all like sheep and have gone astray. Each one has turned to their own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Wow. See, as we long for, as the, the ancients longed for the balm of Gilead to bring physical healing, yet it could not heal the more deeper spiritual wounds that sin had caused in humanity. And it was a wound that only the blood of Jesus could heal, and the prophets knew it. We see in this prophecy that Jesus was sacrificed on a cross. This was a, a, a sacrifice for spiritual healing to the wound of sin and the effect. In one sense, Jesus is our balm. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the balm of healing. He has healed us also from our spiritual transgressions. Gilead was a place of covenant, so Golgotha would become the new place of covenant, when, where the Lord would write his laws upon our hearts. We become justified through the blood. The balm of Gilead requires multiple incisions into the tree for the fluid of the tree to flow out to make the healing balm. Likewise, Jesus was now to a tree, and his body was broken, and his bark, the skin, was pierced, and the bark blood flew out and flowed for us. However, the major difference was that no tree in Gilead had ever gave up itself for our healing. Jesus was a sacrifice. The tree wasn't. The tree was harvest. The trees didn't die. They harvest them. But Jesus died on a cross and his blood was shed for each one of us. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22 says, He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. Yet when they held insult at him, he did not retaliate. He suffered. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. I love that scripture. Amen. How many of us turn to temporary balms, temporary solutions in life instead of trusting Jesus? Now, even physically, there's so many pro uh, programs on defeating getting old, mm -hmm. defeating death, looking young. When my mum was young, uh, well, middle age, I suppose, she used to use, I don't think they make it anymore, and French. The Anne French uh, cream, she used to put on moisturiser cream, and she used to put on Anne French, and she'd always say, if she hadn't got the makeup on, she'd say, oh, oh, don't open the front door, I haven't got my face on. And she used to call her makeup her face. Don't open the front door, I haven't got my face on yet. But we live in a society where we are trying uh, to defeat old age and get in elderly and we're trying all these different things and guess what? No one ever beat it. 
and most of those who had plastic surgery look worse than they ever would have done if they just leave it alone. Stop prodding it and poking it and beating it. Just grow old gracefully. We've got some beautiful people here. Do you know what the scripture says? Your grey hair is your crown of glory. Amen. Amen. In the ancient times, the, the older generations were glorified and honoured and respected. They were the mark creators of the family. Nowadays, young people look at the elderly and think, oh God, you ain't going to talk to you. What are you? You don't know nothing. You know? And there's no respect, there's no honour, and parents aren't even teaching their children to respect the elderly. Now, I'm not saying the elderly are right about everything, okay? But, nevertheless, we should respect, honour, and love. But so often in life, we're using all these different plasters and we're putting a plaster on a mortal wound. And we're just putting a plaster on it. If, if you fall off a balcony and you hit the ground and your leg comes off, the bottom half of your leg, okay, you need more than a plaster. All right? Plaster ain't going to do no good right now. You need an ambulance. You need a specialised nurse. You need a needle and cotton. You probably need a blood transfusion. You need a whole lot of stuff. Somebody coming up and saying, well, I've got a plaster. What's that going to do? And when you're trying to fulfil the problem areas of life by covering up with just a new plaster every time. And all you're doing, loads and loads of plasters, you're still bleeding to death on the battlefield. But you've got a lot of plasters. See, it only comes in, real healing will only come in when you truly submit completely. When you get to the point, you say, I give up. White flag, I surrender. I just give up. I just surrender, all of it. I just don't care anymore. You know, and I learned this as a young Christian. God's going to get his way anyway. He wins anyway. Stop fighting. He wins anyway, and you spend your life fighting over something God's going to win anyway. So it's far better to say, do you know what, I'll give up. I'll give up now. I just surrender, Lord. I surrender to your best. I think my best is pretty good. But you think your best is better. So I'm going to give up what I think is my best. And I'm just going to trust that I will get your best. You know? And as a young man, I had a few relationships and so on and so forth uh, before I got saved, and then I got saved and I met Mara. And at first, there was no physical attraction to Mara. And for me, as a non Christian, that was like really important. I had to flip my switch, otherwise, what was the point? You know? But there was just, I didn't feel anything. But my friend, who uh, I'd led to the Lord, he one day says to me, because Marla joined the church, he says to me, oh, I really like that Spanish girl. Blah, 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 he's going on and on and on about it. And I was really pleased for him, because he'd been in a bad place. I said, look, I tell you, I don't know her, but you can sing in worship, that girl like the Lord. There's nothing else, that's all I know. So he made his advances, and she gave him the big elbow, and there wasn't even COVID, and she gave him the elbow. And then another guy I led to the Lord, had been a homosexual. And I led him to the Lord. And he renounced that and he moved on. And then one day he says to me, do you know what? I quite like that Spanish bird. Now when he said that to me, I thought, there's a God, he's alive, he's in heaven, hallelujah. I said, go for it, that's wonderful. And of course, she gave him the elbow. Until one day, somebody approaches me and says, Matthew, this Spanish girl, I think you would make a wonderful couple. And I was called into my pastor's office. My pastor called me in. I didn't know what for. I thought I was in trouble. Because I'd shared in the morning the vision I'd had. And I, I was only 19. I thought I'd said something wrong. I'd sent everyone to hell. I'm in trouble. The pastor wants to see me. And as I go into his office, Mama's in the office. And she told the pastor about these other guys liking her. But she wasn't very keen. She didn't know what to do. So he said, well, who is it 
Do you like? She said, well, I like Matthew, but I don't want you to say anything because I kind of just want it to be gone. He said, you just wait there. <laughs> yeah, you know how God works. Gary's off, gets me, I'm 19, just come back to the Lord. And uh, we're standing in the office, never, just standing there, didn't know what to do or anything. And he looked at us and said, right, you two make a lovely couple, treat her like a lady, and he walked out of the office and left them. I was just standing there. But you know what, my flesh got in the way, and after about six weeks or so, I just this is just not for me, it's just not working. And we broke up, I broke up with Mark. And we were split for a couple of months. And then one day I was driving my car and the Lord said to me, Mammy Mama. And I'm saying, you are not listening. We are having the conversation, the Lord said to me, Mammy Mama. I said, I don't want to marry Mama. I noticed you're not married, but I've got to be married. I don't want to marry Mama. And the Lord said to me, you're the bride of Christ. You are my bride. He said, Mary Mama. So in the end, it's God. It's like, I'm not. Like, so I said, all right, well, I'm Mary Mama, but in five years' time, when my life is absolutely terrible, I will come before you and say, this is my life, it's absolutely terrible, and it's your fault. And I went off, and I met with Mama, and I asked her to marry me. And at that point of time, I didn't have all the rosy feelings, there were no fireworks, it was more like a deflated balloon. <laughs> you know? But after I made that decision, God put a love for her in my heart. And I was transformed, and my woman, God was transformed. You know? And oh, did I hit the jackpot? Did I hit the jackpot? But that was God. See, but you've got to live a fully surrendered life. Stop fighting, stop holding on to it. You're trying to do it your way. You're trying to get everything your way. And God says, you, you can have it, but it's not going to be your way. It's got to be my way. And then I laughed. So sometimes we put plastered on mortal wounds. We're, we're dealing with the symptoms rather than the cause. And your symptoms keep manifesting. Okay? If you've got a cold, it means you sneeze a lot. Is sneezing the illness? No. The flu is the illness. That's the problem. The sneezing is just your body trying to get rid of it. It's just a manifestation. And the problem is we spend all of our time in life and relationships dealing with manifestations rather than dealing with causes. Amen? And the blood of Jesus deals with the cause. The balm of Gilead deals with the manifestation. Amen? Even people are rejected and suffer from rejection and fears. Most of the time they're just dealing with the manifestations rather than dealing with the deep-rooted problems. We can be in this cycle and it can lead to unhealthy expectations of other people around us because we feel rejected. You've got a problem with rejection, so you've got unhealthy expectations of other people, what they should or shouldn't be doing in your life. And it's not fair. Nobody else can complete you. Mm. Even in marriage, my wife does not complete me. Jesus completes me. She complements me. But she doesn't complete me because he said he would complete me, but she would complement me. Eve was the helpmate to Adam. Okay? Adam wasn't incomplete. She became the helpmate. So even for those of us who have lost people dear to us, a part of you is not missing. Because you're complete in Lord Jesus. But you go through the sadness and the heartache of losing somebody that you love. But the joy is that somebody you love, you're going to meet again. You, Christ Jesus. Amen? And when you meet them, they wouldn't need no plastic surgery. <laughs> Amen? Because they're going to be perfect, with a perfect body. You know? They're going to be wonderful. My mum was deaf. All her children were deaf, all her grandchildren were deaf. The only two sounds she can remember hearing was the air raid sirens in the war and birds singing. She never once heard the voices of any of her children. 
you know? And uh, when I get to heaven and meet her one day, she's going to hear my voice. Amen. And she'll probably look at me if they're all sat up and squeaking. <laughs> no, <laughs> to, to, it'd be wonderful because we'd be complete. If someone suffers from eczema, they need to apply the medicine, the correct medicine, and use it in the right place. You don't have a, a, a eczema on your knee and then get the cream and put it on your forehead and then mug the cream don't work, doctor. <laughs> doctor, you give me this cream for my eczema, it hasn't moved anyway. It's got worse, it's spreading. Well, how do you apply in the cream? Well, I put it on my head and on my elbow. But it don't work. And it won't work. You've got to apply the right thing in the right place to get the right result. We need to confess that we are struggling sometimes. It's healthy to confess we are struggling sometimes. If you try not to confess your struggling with various things, you will burn yourself out. And you're living as a hypocrite at the end of the day. Do you know what a hypocrite means? To be a hypocrite means to live one thing whilst living another. It's like being an actor, you know? That's what it's like. And so, sometimes you, you just got to be real. That doesn't mean to say you've got to be falling apart every Sunday morning when somebody says, hello, how are you? How's your week been? She says, oh, sit down, I'll tell you about it. And go through this huge list about Tony. No! <laughs> but she might appreciate a phone call in the week to say, should we meet for coffee? have a chat. How are you doing? You know? We need that accountability in our life. Why? Because it causes us to use the word correctly. We need to turn to the one who can heal the wounds. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. The Lord is close. Now, if you don't feel it, it's irrelevant. Because God doesn't say, oh, they can't feel it, so I'll just back off to the other side of the universe then. <laughs> you know? Whether you feel it or not, or accept it or not, the Word says it, and the Word is our authority. That's our authority, not how we feel. How we feel is not the authority in life. You don't make decisions based upon how you feel because you feel different from one day to the next, from one hour to the next. Your feelings change. If the government at nine o'clock tonight do a news thing and say, right, sorry, because of the Indian COVID virus, we're going to shut down the whole country for another six months, you can't do nothing. How are you going to feel? You're going to be gutted, you're going to be fed up, you're going to be annoyed, you're going to be frustrated. But that hasn't happened. So what? So you don't feel like that then. You feel excited about tomorrow because it means you're going to be able to get out and meet with friends and so on and so forth. So therefore your feelings change depending on your circumstances. And because your circumstances change, it means you can't make decisions based on feeling. You have to make decisions based on the Word of God. This is what I need to make the decision based on. This. Not feelings, because they're going to change. The result of turning to the Lord Jesus for the eternal bar as well. The eternal bar of the blood of Jesus changes the life and the lives of those around you. There is a greatness when we realise the joy that can only be found in Jesus and that Jesus is with you in your circumstance. Mm -hmm. Oh, it could be a bad day, but do you know what? I've got God with me. I've got, I haven't got the answer to the world's problem, but I've got God with me. I know the rock on what I'm standing. There could be an earthquake on the left and an earthquake on the right, but as... I know I'm on solid ground because I'm trusting God. Through the blood of Jesus, we receive forgiveness for our sins. Matthew 26, 28. Through the blood of Jesus, we are cleansed from all sin that brought darkness and it brings us into light. 1 John 1, 6-7. 
We have victory through the blood of Jesus. Victory over the enemy and victory over accusations. Revelation 12 verse 11. Our freedom is purchased by the blood of Jesus. Revelation 1 verse 5. We are brought near to God through the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 2 13. The blood of Jesus sanctifies us and makes us holy. Hebrews 13 12. We have secure, eternal security and redemption through the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 9 verse 12. Serving God, the living God, we can only have access to serve God and his people through the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 9 verse 14. Isaiah 61 is the prophetic statement of Jesus' mission. That when Jesus was in the temple, he got up and he opened the scroll. And when he opened it, I think it's in Mark chapter 3, when he opened it, he says that he read, well, this is the, the portion of text that he read. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn in Zion. Now, I'll stop there just for a minute. It says to comfort all who mourn. Jesus never said, do not mourn. You're, you're a big enough Christian, you're more spiritual than this. Your friends in heaven, get over and move on. No, what a load of rubbish. Ignore anybody who says that. They do not know the word of God. Jesus says, mourn, but not like those who have no hope. Shed your tears. Mourn. You're human. I understand the feelings of loss and the emptiness right now. But remember there's a hope. There's a hope. Lean on that hope. And provide for those who grieve in Zion. Bestow upon them a crown of beauty instead of the ashes, instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of the mourning, instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord, for they will display his splendor. Hallelujah. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Jesus is speaking. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And sometimes, you know what? You've just got to yoke yourself to Jesus. Now, in, the, in biblical times, the yoke was a wooden collar that they put around two animals so that when they pulled the car, they would pull it at the same weight. They would go forward together. Okay? And so they yoked them together. And with Jesus, he said, take my yoke, put this yoke on, because I've got the victory. I've won the battle, my blood is shed, I'm resurrected, and I'm coming back to my church. Amen. That's the joy. That's the hope. In closing, I'm just going to read a powerful quote from a pastor called Tim, Timothy Killer. And it says this, I love this, it's very good. If we look to created things to give us meaning and hope and happiness that only God himself can give, it will eventually break our hearts. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that powerful? See, when we're chasing after other things to fill the void that only God can fill, 
And it can be a relationship, it can be a career, it can be a business, it can be a house, it can be anything. That you're using that thing to fulfill a place only God can fulfill. We're going to read it again, but with my own paraphrase. If we look to the balm of Gilead, instead of the blood of Jesus, we'll not receive all that he has for us. Amen.